All right. So are we ready to go? All right. So uh, thank, thanks everyone for tuning in for this last session of the STEM Village Virtual Symposiums. This is session eight and we have uh, wonderful talks lined up for you. Um, and uh, my name is Mehmet Kurd. I'll be co-chairing this session with uh, Matthew Sinton, who is the founder of the STEM Village, pronounced he, him. And uh, our first talk slash dialogue will be between um, Dr. Lisa Grumlick, I hope I am not butchering your last name, and um, Melissa Watkinson. And it will be on an international, intergenerational, intersectional uh, dialogue. So I'm very much looking forward to this, and it's a pleasure to have you both here. And take it away when you're ready. Thank you so much, and thank you to the organizers. Um, it's it's amazing to be here with all of you. I just wish I could see all of you, but I can't. Um, my name is Lisa Gromlick. I go, I have she, her pronouns. I am the Dean of the College of the Environment at the University of Washington. And I am a paleoclimatologist. I've been somebody that has been asking the question, is climate changing because of human activity for about the last 40 years? Um, and it's a pleasure to be with my colleague, Melissa Watkinson. Hi, Lisa. Thanks so much. It's nice to see you. Thanks also to the organizers for letting me participate in this discussion today. Uh, my name is Melissa Watkinson. I use she, her pronouns. I'm a citizen of the Chickasaw Nation of Oklahoma, which is a Native American tribe that was forcibly removed from our original territories in what is now called Alabama and Mississippi. I'm joining the symposium today from Bremerton, Washington which is the traditional homelands of the Suquamish and Duwamish peoples. It has become a growing practice in the United States to acknowledge the first stewards of the lands and waters uh, of the place where we are standing and calling in from. I'm a social scientist and diversity, equity, and inclusion lead at Washington Sea Grant, which is an organization whose mission is to help people and marine life thrive by supplying research, technical expertise, and educational activities that support the responsible use and conservation of ocean and coastal ecosystems. Uh, Washington Sea Grant is located in the College of Environment at University of Washington, which is where I've had the pleasure of meeting and getting to know uh, Dean Lisa Gromlick. So thanks again for inviting me to participate with you. So I thought I'd lead it off by just saying a little bit about one of the themes that Melissa and I hope to bring forward both in our remarks and potentially in some really interesting Q&A type dialogue. And one of those themes is to me what I call the gifts of being gay. So imagine if you will, like I'm the dean. I'm like this senior person in the college and the college has 200 some faculty and it actually has like 800 research professionals like Melissa and 2000 students and you know, like. Yeah, I, I get to know you if you have a big problem, you know, but do I get to know people just to get to know people? Not very much. So I was at a some kind of meeting about marine conservation and there was Melissa and she was saying really smart things and she kind of looked interesting. And this is like, does your generation use the word gaydar? I can't yes. hear you, of course. <laughs> okay, so like, I'm like, Hmm, she looks interesting. And then I like get on social media, not in like an obnoxious stocky way, but just like, hmm. And sure enough, she has this like lovely partner and this, and so I became more bold and said, I think I said, Melissa, like, uh, wanna do coffee? And so Melissa and I started like taking walks and drinking coffee and sharing stories about our lives. and. As Dean, I do not get to do this. Mm -hmm. And so the gift of my friendship with Melissa is that I have learned a lot about what an early career person with sort of some lovely and wonderful and complex intersecting identities working in this incredibly important area of marine conservation, what mm -hmm. her work and her life are like. And 
to be honest, I wouldn't have I wouldn't have asked her out for coffee if it was not for this mutual recognition that we shared mm -hmm. something in our personal life that went above and beyond science. So, mm -hmm. Melissa, thank you for your friendship. Yeah. And um, and I hope as we're sort of gathering today that we sort of think about despite some of the trials and tribulations we have as queer people in STEM, there's these moments of recognition and they can be super rich. Mm -hmm. So that's how we got here with Melissa and I talking to you. Yeah, I, as you're um, talking, it's just making me reflect on kind of this idea of representation and how important it is. And I know, particularly for my generation, and um, because I think it's more possible that there is representation of, of different identities within STEM fields and other fields, right? Um, that it's always something that we kind of talk about and is important. So, uh, so having seen you, you know, you know, and some others within our college uh, being out and gay, uh, that representation was important for my own growth and identity uh, within my career. And just hearing you speak, though, it sounds like that same re that same representation is important um, across, you know, from your generation to mine as well, which is something I hadn't really considered before, um, just in terms of being able to continue to connect with those identities that you share with. Um, so I appreciate you sharing that. Yeah, absolutely. So Melissa, to start this dialogue, um, although I actually know some of the answer to this, but um, how and when did you come out? Yeah, so my my journey is as everyone's journey is um, is unique. I, I would say I came out. I started coming out to my very close friends and um, very close cousins. I starting around the age of eighteen, um, and I was coming out as bisexual at that time. And I think at that point, that was really all the extent of what I felt con had felt confident in. Uh, and, and believed in for myself. I grew up in, um, in a family that was uh, attended an evangelical church that would often um, make me uh, oppress and suppress my own, myself um, in terms of my own um, identity as a queer person. And that you know, led me to getting married at a very young age to a man and uh, you know, having this kind of idea of what I, th I thought society expected of me in my life. Um, I you know, was not on a path of, uh, of science. I was not on a path of academia, really. I was on a track that would kind of fulfill what I thought uh, you know, a good woman was supposed to do in our society, um, which was, you know, communicated through me to me by the church and likely through media and other formats. Um, and I, th I somehow, I think just through the different networks I was building and community I was building in Seattle, my, my lens opened up a little bit more. And so um, I'm grateful for that, uh, that opportunity to open up a little bit to myself um, and then more to others as well. And so I actually um, finally came out to my family about three years ago, actually. So fairly recently um, came out to my family and out, and out as gay, um, which was a, a big milestone for myself. Um, I, I guess for anybody, right, who's coming out, out, of, out of the closet. Um, because it's a, it takes a lot of courage, you know, to, to be um, that person and so, around that same time was when I started um, in my current position. And I think it was, you know, acknowledging that there are others in our, um, in our STEM field and in um, the areas with where we work that can help me to gain some confidence that it's, uh, you know, you can be successful, you can be, uh, show up to, as, to work as who you are um, and be true yourself uh at the same time so um yeah lisa how about you i know that i know that your your journey came uh, a little bit before mine and um <laughs> a little bit different so 
How about you? What what was what was your journey for coming out? Well, you know, certainly some parallels with respect to various versions of feeling like it wasn't okay. And I think those messages were um, actually not that it wasn't okay, that it just wasn't talked about. And so I knew I had these sort of really deep longings and they weren't, you know, I, I don't even think I knew what the word lesbian was. And, and so looked to, um, my mother was an English teacher. So I would like look to literature and yes, you can find like these tragic lesbian stories and everybody always dies at the end. And, and, you know, it wasn't like, Oh, this doesn't look so great. Um, and I go to college and I was really excited because I saw a, on a bulletin board, a flyer, and it was a lesbian support group. Mm. And it was sort of the notion like support, like, like, you know, like he needed help. I thought, oh my God, you know, that's me. Um, and I was at a relatively large university and I went to the meeting and there were three people there. And, um, you know, this is the seventies where, what can I say, sort of drugs and alcohol, you know, it was all sort of cool. And it was the first time I saw people that, you know, I really think these people are probably like indulging too much. So there were two people there that were really just kind of getting drunk. And the other person was trying to figure out how to go straight. And so I thought, oh dear, this mm. is kind of like the stories I was reading in the books. And so kind of went away from there. And like you, Melissa, I got married. I was like, okay, I can just like, and I got married mm. to this. He's actually a wonderful man, but he was like really heterosexual. Like, like, like <laughs> this guy, like he's like heterosexual. So that means I'm heterosexual. Mm. And we moved to Madison, Wisconsin. And on the very first 24 hours, of me being the newly wed. I'm like in Madison and it's filled with these gorgeous gay women, like publicly displaying affection. And I'm like, oh no, oh no, oh no. I just like got married and it was the wrong choice. So I found a way to exit out of that. But it took, it took years to come out to my parents. And it's just, you know, it's sort of, you know, there's, it's, it's a process um, that we all do. Mm -hmm. so, so part of, one of the things we've had conversations about, Melissa, are sort of messages that friends and family and um, mentors and colleagues give you about sort of your career. Like here you are, mm -hmm. queer and what's going to happen? You know, like, how are you going to navigate that identity and, and, you know, the incredibly important work you're doing as a social scientist in marine conservation? Mm -hmm. How's that going? <laughs> <laughs> well, I think, I, you know, in terms, in terms of the identity of queer, you know, I, I, I guess I've, I've always been queer and I've always been, uh, Indigenous, you know, a, a term to just kind of reflects my um, native heritage, and um, the journey of kind of uh, owning those different identities um, has been a little bit, a little bit different. But I, but I think you know, acknowledged acknowledged my own and known about my own indigenous heritage prior to knowing about my queerness. Um, so. Mm -hmm. So I've always just kind of, and that's just inherent in who I am. And so I think I, you know, a lot of, a lot of those kinds of challenging questions actually first came up around um, that part of my identity and my background, um, being a native person, because a lot of my work is working um, with tribes uh, in Washington state and on um, conservation related topics that uh, are important to me only because um, the, some of the my native family and, and, the, and the way that I grew up um, culturally was related to the health and well-being of our marine ecosystems and so uh, of those kinds of questions and, and conversations with um, those who are close to me in terms of my career were were more related to 
you know how because it, it it's it's not just a academic lens right it's a it's a it's an emotional um a mental uh state um that i'm that also that i also that also requires someone who um is you know has these kinds of different relationships with the marine environment to be doing that kind of conservation work in a place where most of the people in that organization don't actually share those identities with you yeah. um yeah. and so that came about this similarly as being gay right and so um or being queer you know in the in the broader sense just just that you're your own identities are are different than others um and so i think you know in terms of the career journey it's most it's the biggest outcome i think has led to um m building my awareness around what kinds of um gaps there are in terms of equity and inclusion of different people and community members and voices within the work that we're doing uh, and I know Lisa that some of the conversations that we've also sh we've also shared um, especially now is um, the environmental movement and the environmental field is growing in conversations of diversity equity and inclusion uh, I think that's really been what has centered um, those conversations in the career and among my my colleagues um, and I think that you know that kind of that that's also a journey you know i before i came out mm -hmm. and i was starting uh my first my first job in this field um i wasn't out but the organization you know was at those the pride parades and um being very visible and present in those areas um and then when it came to like conversations that i was a part of around um, pride or LGBT, uh, my voice was off, often kind of silenced um, because I wasn't out, and um, and I think for me that was a you know a waking a wake up moment for me. Now, think, reflecting on that moment, that there are probably others with that we're working with who um, might not be out, right? And how do we make a voice for them in these places too? Um, going from that to, to where I am now and, and having Lisa as a friend and mentor and um, other other super, you know, supervisors and mentors within our college who are out and, and provide that strong representation. Um, that's been a, a good progress in my own career journey. You know, I'm sure everyone in this Zoom live stream, YouTube space, all has also that memory of those moments where you're quiet and your voice isn't there and just mm -hmm. how frustrating and, and really sort of devastating that is. And it reminds me of a story that interestingly, it's a story that goes way back to the 1980s and that I was reluctant to share until just a few years ago. That's about that sort of voice. So it's about my first years in the 1980s as an assistant professor at the University of Arizona. Um, and I was very excited. I was in a, I was the first woman hired in a unit and, you know, was kind of digging in my assistant professorship and was really um, excited when a senior mentor, like a vice provost who was a woman and a scientist kind of took me under her wing and she wanted to mentor me and it was Arizona so we would go hiking and we would talk and she was very accomplished and I felt very trusting of her and on one of these hikes she like gets really serious and she says to me Lisa it's okay to be gay just don't tell anyone and I was like okay uh I think that was kind of positive like it was okay to be gay I'm not supposed to tell anybody and okay and she's like a vice provost so I need to take her seriously and so mm -hmm. for a couple years I like I did that thing of like okay I'm just not gonna tell anybody and I'm gonna like mm -hmm. say these like really stupid things like what'd you do over the weekend oh my friend and I you know did whatever you know like and you're just kind of like putting up all these barriers and then kind of never really being present because you're scared you're gonna say things 
so the story gets better. So this fancy vice provost woman nominates me for a super prestigious fellowship. It was 50 people from the entire country over all aspects of science would get this sort of opportunity for a three year leadership fellowship. It's really complicated. You know, you write an essay and then you make it to the next level and you get to write more essays and you make it to the next level. And it all kind of culminates in there's a hundred of us that will be interviewed for 50 positions and they fly us into a fancy, into an, actually I think it was Houston and we're staying in a super fancy hotel and we're gonna have an hour with the selection committee. And I get it like a really beautiful suit and I have my talking points and I'm all ready to talk about my vision. You know, it's kind of a climate change and the future of the future. And I'm all ready. And it's going really well. And they're like mm -hmm. scribbling down notes and they're nodding at me. And I'm like, oh man, this is going to be great. And I'm at the last question and they say to me, what is the hardest thing you've ever done? And you know, when you, I'm in a groove and I immediately know the hardest thing I've ever done is to come out. And all I can hear is that vice provost word saying, like, don't tell anybody, don't tell anybody. Mm -hmm. And I just completely froze. And I'm sure I looked like I was going to throw up. I felt like I was going to throw up. I felt like, like the deer in the headlights. And I was just like, I'm just silent. And I'm like, I'm going to say it. No, I'm not going to say it. I'm going to say it. I'm going to say it. And I didn't say it. And I said like this really stupid thing, like, oh, like getting atmospheric scientists to talk to biologists. I mean, it's not, like, it was like the stupidest thing. And I also like clearly looked terrified. And I walked out of the room. I remember it's this fancy hotel. You know, the hotel elevators where there's mirrors on three sides. Mm -hmm. I get in to the hotel elevator by myself and all I see is me like, oh my God. And there I am. And I've just like lost it. You know, I just like lost this chance because mm -hmm. I would not come out. And I literally like looked myself in the eye and I said, you are never doing that again. And I didn't. Mm -hmm. And what was crazy was in particular, the next couple of years, yeah, I, I didn't get the fellowship, duh. But the next couple of years just kind of unleashed this creative, bold leadership that, you know, kind of got me to be the dean I am today. And it was because, and I, I really wish I could have eye contact with all of you out there. It was because I had my whole self in my science. I wasn't always mm. putting these barriers up. And so for those of you that are hesitant and, and have gotten these messages from powerful people, like don't come out, don't listen to them. Listen to Melissa and me, because it really is that bringing your whole self to your work, all of our identities for Melissa, her incredibly important understanding and knowledge of what it means to be indigenous in a time in which that traditional knowledge has always been, but even more so is critical. You know, all of that needs to be there. So mm -hmm. that's my story. But you know, what's, what's even crazy is, you know, those, those, that lingering homophobia, I did yeah. not tell that story. For decades, I was too scared yeah. to tell that story. So. Yeah. Thank you so much for sharing. That's a real, it's really powerful to hear and to reflect on how culture and society and even our the work that we're doing has evolved over these generations in this time and um, I, I'm, I'm reflecting you know I, I feel like you know we're speaking to a global audience right now and we are um, we're both living you know live in or around the Seattle area which is known to be kind of a progressive city uh, in a state that's that's probably, you know, past um, same-sex marriage before most of the rest of the country. Um, and I, I guess even like less than two months ago, I was in an, on another call with my Sea Grant colleagues uh, across the United States and talking about this concept of kind of being able to show up as your full self to work. Uh, and then one person anonymously chat, put in the chat box, um, or a Q and A box saying, you know, but I'm 
a lesbian and I actually can't be out uh, within my Sea Grant program because of the, the state where my Sea Grant program is, I can legally still be fired for coming out, for being who I am. And I think within two weeks, actually, the Supreme Court uh, made a decision that overruled that. Um, so now you can't legally be fired from your physician in the United States for being out. Um, but that doesn't, that, you know, that, that was just a symbol for me to recognize too, that that's just kind of what was happening and, and maybe in our bubble um, that, that I wasn't aware of in other parts of the United States and let alone to this global community that we're talking to. Um, so there so it's, are these factors that, um, you know, that are the differences of Lisa and I's experience might transcend to those kinds of experiences across different um, different nations around the world um, where where it may still not be safe um, for people to be out or visibly um, queer in public. Um, and so those are privileges that I often recognize and reflect on. Um, and you know, and I and I'm and I do want to you know participate in these activities. I suppose in in terms of wanting to um, change that for folks. You know, I I I'm feel so fortunate to not have to be in that situation um, and to feel welcomed. And so I hope that um, you know more of these kinds of conversations can encourage um, the the continued progression of that acceptance in our in the world. Um, one of the things that you and I, you know, have been talking about are kind of the the ways that queerness intersect with different parts of who we are, right? Um, and mm -hmm. our different identities. And in some ways, you know, you talked about, you know, we have these different superpowers um, as being queer, and, mm -hmm. and some of these other ways that they these superpowers are strengthened, and and how in the other ways that we show up in the world. Um, do you have some some superpowers that uh, you kind of are able to pull out and, and, and what kinds of other identities um, strengthen those superpowers for you? It's funny. Um, well, I'm going to start with, once again, sort of going way back. Um, so besides, when I was in graduate school, besides um, being a graduate research assistant, I would also be a bartender at a lesbian bar. And and it's so funny because you guys can't, I'm kind of tall. I'm actually not that athletic, but because I was tall, I was the one that was in charge of escorting cranky men out of the bar when they came to sort of cause trouble. And, and so, first of all, I think that we end up um, in our lives, in the gay community, in the queer community, um, we we cope with situations. You know, we we learn to listen. We learn to be sensitive to social situations and assessing: is there danger? Is there not danger? And how do we diffuse danger, et cetera, et cetera? And so there's this whole social awareness, and at times needing to step in and intervene. Um, that I think of as you know one of sort of the powers that that we get, and I just I just laugh because you know what early then as an assistant professor, there'd be like these classroom management questions that like my peers had, and it's like <laughs> like this is nothing. <laughs> you know, these, these are well-behaved nineteen-year-olds. You know, you you have not been trying to escort drunk, angry men out of a gay bar before. Um, so anyway, so so there's, I think there's ways, the, the richness of sort of the lives that we live, but more seriously, um, I, we, we've had some talks about this, Melissa, I feel like there's always this kind of insider, outsider um, identity that we have. So, you know, as a sort of privileged white person, you know, I like participate in science. As a woman, there's there's issues, but then you know, being queer, there's always a little bit of like 
ooh, am I part of the gang or I'm part of the gang? And there's been ways in which the kind of social part of how we do sign together it has I've been shy out of it. And um, so I just kind of started doing more and more deeply interdisciplinary work. And this kind of, you know, particularly to you, Melissa, this is going to kind of seem, duh, like, why wouldn't you do this? But to try to get physical scientists, biological scientists, and social scientists to work together to understand climate change on vulnerable communities, mm. that was like a radical idea. Yeah. And, <laughs> um, and I think my comfort about it had to do with bridging identities and and talking across, in this case, academic cultures. And and so it really, um, the kind of leadership that I was able to bring to my work really had to do with a lot of skills I had that were just from kind of navigating multiple identities. Does any of that resonate with you? Actually, so Lisa and I kind of talked a little bit briefly ahead of time, what, what, we, what kinds of topics to go over and I literally my notes are reflective of what you were just saying um, in preparation and and um, you know we've we used the word code switching before and and that can come in multiple different ways in this in this kind of professional setting I can definitely you know I've, I've heard some people call it bridge spanning and and I do think that that's one of the bigger strengths that um, that I have, and I think that's very true as a result of um, building, you know, having that inward, inside and outside um, identity, outside, you know, um, presence. Um, you're, span, you're, you're spanning these boundaries, bringing in, you know, building, helping to support collaborations, connecting people across different sides together. Um, and, you know, I am a social scientist working on trans bound or transdiscipline projects, right, when these larger collaborations. Um, and I think that, you know, that's likely a, a skill set that comes straight from um, having to identify how that happens in our, in our, in our lives that we've built over time. Um, and uh, yeah, I guess so I definitely have resonated um, with that experience for sure. Um, I had a, I had this, uh, this thought, but it just escaped me. So <laughs> maybe end it there, but, um, yeah, that's definitely, definitely huge. Um, I would say, uh, I would say in addition to, to that, um, that superpower, one of the other things that I think has propelled me to be able to do that, um, is, you know, I, I, told, I said I had always been, you know, up until recent, up until I came out to my family, I, I came out as bisexual to many folks, um, to those that were closest to me. Uh, I also have am biracial. And, and so there's always this kind of sense. Um, I mean, these, this is just assuming, you know, assuming that these things are on a binary, um, as we know that they're, as we know they're not, but, um, this kind of like thing in the middle, like, do I belong on this side or that side, you know, having to kind of essentially be like, who am I? I'm also a middle child. So, you know, where, where do I belong? Um, and so, you know, once I kind of have found that in my, the, the career that the trajectory I'm in, um, it made me really want to um, utilize that, that own, um, finding in myself to be able to um, help to bridge the those things that were kind of you know on those binary sides um, previously and help to bridge those together and so I, th I think that's a part of it uh, that has shaped that perspective for me as well. And Melissa like our usual conversations we could like go deep on all of these things but you know <laughs> I think it, it I think it helps break down those binaries, which we know, you know, in science aren't all, certainly in science and in a lot of the work that we're both engaged in with, which is trying to translate and the, the work that we do into knowledge that's actually intersecting the lives and livelihoods of, of people, you know, it, the binaries mm -hmm. aren't. <laughs> yeah. For most of the problems we work on, they don't fall into binaries. Yeah. So I'm watching 
my my clock mm -hmm. my little corner um and i know that one of the questions i think let's let me say this is my last question to you so that we have time to have anyone who wants to share their superpowers but melissa i used to see you all the time on campus and now i haven't yeah. seen you for like six months yeah. and how are you taking care of yourself in the midst of the pandemic and all of the yeah rage that we're feeling right now about what's yeah. going on in this country in terms of police brutality that mm. just is not ending so how are mm. you how are you taking care of yourself I'm doing okay. I'm I'm leaning on those who um, bring me comfort, and I and I, you know, in thinking about this kind of conversation around a queer village, I think that uh, my partner and I are fortunate. We we moved and we bought a house and moved um, just outside the city about a year ago, and we're fortunate to kind of quickly identify some other queer couples that live nearby, and um, brought them into our kind of quarantine bubble. So uh, we've been able to have, you know, backyard barbecues and share cocktails and laughs and talk about what's going on in the world. Um, and really like leaning on that, on that queer village that we have uh, in, in, our, in our little um, neighborhood here has been really helpful. Um, that and, and adopting a new dog has been um, providing a lot of emotional support and cuddles that you know we we don't get to find otherwise so yeah it's um it's been it's been hard and um and also shows to show what i'm grateful you know what what can, we can be grateful for how about you how are you and your family doing lisa well we're doing okay we're we're you know we're all physically healthy but we're we're stressed i have a 17 year old daughter going into senior year in high school and this is not what she anticipated and she's black and she's we are so deep into thinking about what black lives matter mm -hmm. and what it means for an uh an interracial family you know so we're so we're a lot on that but i am really grateful mm -hmm. and the reason i'm in this sort of funny hotel is dirt and i took her off to the mountains to oh, um great. just to get away for 24 hours and mm. smell pine trees and walk through sage and so and eat a lot of really good food that's yeah it's our love language is oh, food good. and more food so, yeah. so well, there might be some berries out there too. Matthew. Oh yeah. We gotta get up to the berries. Thank you. We will do that and and think of you. Um so we have when Melissa and I talked about this, we had this fantasy that oh my gosh, there's something in the chat. Matthew and our our wonderful behind the scenes people keeping us organized. Do we have some comments or questions or superpowers being shared? Can you help us? Um, I, I don't see questions as of now, but I have a question actually, if you don't mind. So uh, I'm in academia too. So I'm an assistant professor in, in an engineering department. So there's something in academia, right? That is the power structure and the hierarchy that makes it hard for LGBTQ people to be visible, really. It is like you and uh, Melissa said, right? It, it is mostly self-suppression in a way because of, I believe, because of the power structure and the hierarchy. And I think mm. that's even harder for graduate students or international graduate students who depend mm. on the funding to stay in the United States, right? Mm. And for assistant professors, it is the tenure structure. There's always a power structure that kind of suppresses the visibility, right? So what is our advice for graduate students or international graduate students who are struggling with those problems. Melissa, do you want to go first? <sighs> yeah, maybe, maybe uh, we, Lisa and I like, will likely have a very different um, perspective on this, just where, we, where we're from. So I graduated, I, went, I finished graduate school in 2015. Um, and I, I, so my, and my experiences, I think following that um, are, are replicable to this question in that, you know, um, 
the one thing that really got me through uh, so much of my experiences was was finding one one to two people who shared in similar identities to me, whether it was a student, another fellow, um, a colleague, who uh, could who I could take regular coffee breaks with and have those working lunches, right, where you're kind of um, maybe maybe all you maybe all you do is give each other a hug and and listen to each other kind of vent for 20 minutes each um, just because you need that space to um, vocalize some of those hardships and I think that's one way to really kind of take care of yourself and your community um, and and I think coming from my perspective that that's where a lot of that um, that self power, that self control can really kind of um, be maintained and sustained. Uh, I know Lisa probably has a perspective in terms of like how those systems in place um, within our within academia can shift a little bit to um, be more open to allow visibility of queer folks. Yeah. Um, first of all, I want to just say, Maymet, what you brought up is so real and particularly the vulnerability of our international students has always been high. And it's just, you know, with the pandemic and sort of rules about visas and, and sort of in the United States, the sort of political climate about, you know, what it means to be, you know, not from the U.S. is, is just so painful right now. So all of that is real. I completely agree with Melissa is finding your network of people that even like across the room, like you can just like your eyes can meet and you like know like, okay, this is someone who's a fellow traveler or ally and, and just nurturing, nurturing, holding on to those people. But then the other piece is um, trying to figure out where there are allied movements for dismantling power and privilege within your institutions, whether they're academic or not. And so right now, United States, of course, the Black Lives Matter movement is so important. And of course, it's important for the life welfare of our Black, Indigenous, people of color, students, staff, and faculty. But every time policies are made more sane, it benefits queer people and it benefits people with different abilities and it benefits people with um, on the spectrum. It benefits, it benefits everyone. And so, you know, the degree to which we show up for supporting the struggles of, of others, I think is a is way we're kind of paying it forward and creating the alliances that will help us make lasting change. Mm. Yeah, that's powerful. I, All right. I, uh, I, I'm looking at the, I'm sorry, I'm looking at the chats and I love, yeah, we need no, more I than think, a week. <laughs> I know, I know. And, and I think Matthew has a question, right, Matthew? Hi, um, actually, it's my husband that has a question, so I'm gonna okay, let, awesome. I'll let him ask it. <laughs> Hi, I've been listening right. in the background, and it's just amazing. Um, and I think one word that uh, you just said resonated with me, and it's uh, the power of invisibility um, and this sort of role play that we have to all kind of play when it comes down to, uh, you know, hiding what we are in order to achieve a position or something in, in academia. Um, and I'm getting to that stage where I feel like we need to have more active roles in taking up space. And so I, I'm curious to see from you guys, uh, what's your um, approach to, to taking up that space when, when, when you're openly gay um, in, in, in you know, atmospheres or places where it's uh, otherwise very rigid, very academic. Um, yeah, just I'm curious about that. You know, it's easier, what can I say? I'm senior, I work my butt off, I played by the rules of the game, I have this fancy position. So like, and actually 
And the University of Washington, actually, for those of you looking for graduate programs, the University of Washington has a Latina queer president. So most of them do live in yeah. this bubble. Um, Melissa, how do you how do you see that? I, okay, so I I think this is a really really important and interesting question. And the what comes to mind for me is so I I pass as white in in a lot of spaces, and so with that comes the white privilege, right? And and I think in terms of what I was talking about before that bridge that bridge spanner that boundary spanner uh, is using that privilege that I have um, to step into those spaces and so you know I'm I am queer I am indigenous so I I do pr uh, benefit from a lot of white privilege and which means that I have a voice that is heard um, more than maybe my black and brown um, and black and brown LGBT um, you know community members and the way that I acknowledge and use that is by you know opening up that space to share um, so that those voices can also be heard uh, so you know I feel I feel in my space in where we are in this kind of bubble that we were that Lisa and I were talking about a little bit um, that you know I I take up as much space as I can already um, and I do that for the benefit hopefully um, of others who who have even less of of that space than I typically would um, because if you know if, if unfortunately we're in systems now um, that that kind of allyship is necessary in order to have that kind of um, equity in the terms of whose voices is, are heard in that process uh, so hopefully that that helps um, you know to think of it of that kind of a question in a, in a little bit of a different way Yeah, thank you. Yes. We have a comment in the chat box, if you can actually perhaps comment on that. It says, as an engineering graduate student, my parents, who are both engineers, have actually been the ones who have encouraged me to hide my identity of non-binary in order to be taken more seriously professionally. I'm still not quite sure what to say to them about that. Oh, you know, that's so hard. They love you, you know. They want to take care of you. They want to protect you. I think um, I want to, I think I want to say it's going to be a journey for you and the degree to which you can hasten the ability to work into your full, beautiful, non-binary identity in the workplace is going to make a difference in not just your own mental health, but the quality of the engineering you do. Find, find your community of mentors and just keep taking the baby steps and take them along with you. It's, it's going to be, it's, it's going to be hard. They're doing it out of love. They're scared, but, don't keep going, keep going, because you're beautiful. You got to do it. Well, with that, thank you so much, Lisa and Melissa, for this extremely touching and amazing dialogue. I mean, if we had time, I could do this until the morning, to be quite <laughs> honest with you. But uh, thank you so much. Uh, this was so touching and so inspiring. And um, yeah. I hope you enjoyed the rest of the conference and I look forward to personally getting in touch with you because I was so touched by your dialogue. So thank you. Thank mm -hmm. you so much for your time. Thank you so much for inviting us. And Lisa, it was really, really great to have this discussion with you. Thanks. Oh, Melissa, thank you for this and for all those conversations we had in the past and in the future. And to the community out there, this international community, take care of yourselves, support yeah. each other, you know, your science needs you, STEM needs you. Okay. Thank you. Bye, everybody. Thank you so Bye. much, Thank Lisa you. and Melissa. Bye. Thank you. Thank you.
All right, with that, we are gonna move on, switch gears, and our next speaker is Serena Lotrek from Michigan State University. And I think Serena is here, right? Yes, hi. <laughs> awesome, hey, how are you? All right, take it away. All right, um, wow, I, Lisa and Melissa, that was incredible. I feel the most, you know, whole and grounded that I think I really have since the beginning of quarantine. So um, thank you again for that. Uh, let me just share my screen here. All right, could I get a confirmation that you guys can see both my presentation and the closed captioning? Yes. Yep. Excellent. All right. So um, my name is Serena Lotrick and I use she, her pronouns, um, and I'm a graduate student at Michigan State University. Um, I'm in the plant biology and computational mathematics, science and engineering departments. Um, and today I'm going to talk to you about uh, domain specific knowledge graphs in plant biology. So uh, just a quick overview of my talk to keep you grounded in, in kind of what's going on here. The first section I'm going to talk to you about why plants, why plant biology. In the second section, I'm going to talk to you about a computational technique called knowledge graphs. And in the third section, I'm going to kind of put it all together and there'll be little boxes in the upper right corner of the slides to kind of keep you on track with this overview. So the first question, right, why plant biology? Um, the simple answer is that by training, I am a plant biologist. Uh, I think plants are just the most fascinating, um, diverse and interesting biological system that's out there. Um, totally my personal bias, um, but also, right, plant biology is the cornerstone of our modern agricultural system. Um, and as I'm sure we're all aware, right, um, climate change uh, threatens this agricultural system of production um, through things like drought and elevated CO2 and increased temperatures, um, but also one of the lesser talked about um, ways that climate change will impact our food is actually through pest management. Um, so in the current day and age, we lose about 40% of our global crop yield to pests every year. Um, and this is with pest management techniques such as pesticides and um, engineered resistance of plants. Um, however, both of these techniques are going to be affected by climate change. Um, the toxicity of pesticides is projected to decrease while the resistance of pests to these pesticides and also engineered resistance mechanisms um, will increase. Um, and so for this project, I've chosen kind of a small subdiscipline of plant biology to focus my first efforts on, and I've chosen the growth defense trade-off of plants. Um, and so this is the idea that defending oneself from insect herbivores is an energy intensive process and it directs energy away from other um, important functions such as growth. But in order to have high fitness, you need to both grow and defend um, in order to have enough biomass to produce seeds um, to make your next generation. And just to clarify in this diagram, um, the acronyms that you see inside the arrows, those are actually plant hormones um, and systems that, that regulate this trade-off through crosstalk. So uh, these hormones are involved in pathways that control one another um, in order to balance this trade-off. All right, so switching topics a little bit, I'm going to tell you about knowledge graphs now. And to motivate um, this technique, I'm going to first tell you that there are 50 million scientific articles and counting in publication in the world today. Um, and that is way too many for any human being to read in their lifetime. And I know you're looking at me and you're saying, Serena, those don't all have to do with you, right? Some of those are about engineering or uh, about human biology or what have you. However, it doesn't really get much better um, if we look at specific disciplines. So PubMed uh, is a search engine for uh, biological literature. Um, and if I put in the search term plant biology, I get 150,000 results. Again, too many for me to read in one lifetime. Narrowing down even farther, uh, flowering time is a well-studied uh, subdiscipline of plant biology, looking at when and why plants flower during the growing season. And if we search flowering time, we get 16,000 results. And if I look at plant defense and growth, which is a little bit of a younger field than flowering time, I still get 10,000 results. And now there's so much information that is buried in this ginormous um, pile of literature. And the only way we have right now to get at that information is to read individual papers. And it's very difficult for us to read large numbers of papers to retain the information that we've read and make connections between papers. So we might ask, right, can computers help us read the literature, right? Computers tend to be faster at everything than we are. So first I'm gonna give you a few definitions. Uh, the first is machine learning. So um, algorithms that learn from the data. 
uh, when you present a machine learning algorithm with a set of data, it looks at the patterns in the data and learns to make predictions based on those patterns. And then natural language processing, or NLP, is the field of computer science that deals with extracting meaning from human language texts. Uh, and this field relies heavily on machine learning. So with both of these definitions under our belts now, can computers help us read the literature? And the answer is both yes and no. So imagine that we have our little happy-go-lucky uh, machine learning algorithm here, right? And we present the algorithm with a text. And in that text is a sentence like, when the hammer fell on the glass table, the table shattered. Great, good, hammer breaks the table, right? We understand exactly what's happening. However, if we change the sentence to when the hammer fell on the glass table, it shattered, what is it? And to you and I, right, it's extremely obvious that, well, of course it was the glass table, right? Because if your hammer breaks upon contact with the glass table, I think you have some other, you know, parallel universe kind of problems. But our algorithm is kind of confused. It doesn't know how to contextualize the information encoded in it in this sentence. Um, and so it has a hard time parsing the meaning of this sentence. So the conclusion here is that while it is difficult for algorithms to understand the nuances of human language, there has actually been a lot of progress in the field of NLP and algorithms can most certainly help us out. And so one of the ways in which algorithms can help us out um, are knowledge graphs. And so a knowledge graph is simply a, an information representation of facts. Um, and it's just a set of um, entities, which are represented in this image by ovals, um, and relationships, which are represented by, represented by arrows, right? So you can see that this is um, previous United States um, presidential administrations, right? And for example, um, we can see the relation first lady connects the Clinton administration with Hillary Clinton. But if we look at the um, Obama administration and Michelle Obama, there is no relation in the graph for first lady. And this is most likely because either there's noise in the data and that information got lost, or it's not explicitly mentioned in the text that was used to build this graph. But the beauty of this technique is that you can actually infer these relationships. And I'll talk about that in a little bit. So there are two major steps in building a knowledge graph. And the first is information extraction, which is composed of several smaller steps. So the first one is named entity recognition. This is where we go in and we look for all the names that are in those ovals in the graph. So for example, in the sentence, Hillary Clinton is the first lady of the Clinton administration, Hillary Clinton and Clinton administration are both named entities. The next step is entity resolution. So we want to be able to, to determine that Hillary Clinton, Hillary and Ms. Clinton all refer to the same underlying real life object, which in this case is Hillary Clinton. And finally, we have relation extraction. Um, this is where we get the relationships between the entities. So, for example, in this sentence, first lady is the relationship between Hillary Clinton and the Clinton administration. So once we've done all of that, we get a set of triples, which are of the form head, relation, tail. And in our example here, the triple is Hillary Clinton, first lady, Clinton administration. Now, while a knowledge graph is essentially just a collection of these triples, there's one more step and that is knowledge graph completion. And this is performed to both clean up the graph, remove any incorrect information, and also um, to infer relationships that may be true. Um, and we do this by a process called knowledge graph embedding. Um, so to illustrate this, imagine that we have a set of axes. Now what we're gonna do is we're gonna represent the head and the tail as vectors on these axes. Um, so in this case down here, I have Obama administration and Clinton administration, and up here I have Michelle Obama and Hillary Clinton. Now, the amazing thing about this technique is that words and entities tend to cluster together by meaning when you represent them as vectors. I still find this to be extremely magical, um, but it's extremely useful. So now we can represent our relation as a vector translation between the two sets of entities. And so since we have explicitly present Clinton administration transposed onto Hillary Clinton by the relationship first lady, we can infer, even if that link is not there in the text, that since the Obama administration is transposed onto Michelle Obama by the same relation first lady, 
we can infer that the relationship First Lady holds between the Obama administration and Michelle Obama. So once we've performed this process, we end up with our completed knowledge graph, um, which has our inferred relationships present. Um, and today I'm just gonna talk to you about my work uh, repurposing named entity recognition tools for plant biology. So um, named entity recognition tools, there are many of them um, that are available. The NLP community is absolutely prolific in creating these robust um, and very accessible tools um, to do entity recognition. So um, this is just a snapshot of the beginning of the Wikipedia page for Obama. Um, and each entity is outlined with a box and the color of the entity and the bold text next to the entity just refer to the type. Um, every model, name entity recognition model, has um, several types um, which it places the entities into categories. And so you can see that this works exceedingly well on this type of text, right? We identify Obama and we identify both spellings of his name. We identify Illinois and the United States in both the abbreviated and the full spelling. And we also successfully identify the Democratic Party as an organization. However, if you're to apply this to scientific texts, especially plant biology texts, we start to run into some problems. Um, so this is an excerpt from an abstract of a paper. Um, and as you can see, we've got some weird stuff going on, right? So we've identified gibberellic acid, which is a plant hormone, and brachypodium distachium, which is a plant as being people. We've identified these acronyms that stand for hormone names as being organizations. This one is my absolute favorite. We've identified the chemical methyl jasmonic acid as being a work of art. Um, for those who may not be familiar, this is what methyl jasmonic acid looks like. And we've also failed to find the entities ethylene and salicylic acid, which are quite important um, entities in plant biology. Now there are um, entity recognizers that have been trained on biomedical text, which is about the closest we can hope to get with a pre-trained tool. Um, and while these tend to perform better than the general models, um, they still don't quite do what we want them to do. So as you can see, right, we've identified ethylene and salicylic acid, but also some funny stuff is happening, right? Wheat genome is identified as two entities when clearly the, the wheat genome is one. So uh, future directions for this project in the short term are to retrain these existing tools, not just for named entity recognition, um, but also for entity resolution, relation extraction, and knowledge graph embedding um, in order to obtain high performance on plant biology literature. And I'm starting um, in the molecular discipline in order to get um, a good footing in retraining these tools, repurposing them, um, so that for my more ambitious long-term goals, I can create graphs that link biological information on disparate scales. So what does that mean, right? Um, if you consider kind of the different fields that we have in plant biology or in any biological discipline, right, they include things like ecology, population genetics, molecular genetics, and biochemistry, right? Now these fields look at different aspects of systems, right? They're oftentimes studying the same thing. For example, the growth defense trade-off actually was an ecological um, topic before it was taken up by molecular geneticists and biochemists. However, if we could create graphs that link information across these scales, we can synthesize understandings of systems as systems rather than as individual aspects of these systems. And this is what I'm the most excited about um, with this project. And then another long-term goal uh, that I'm also so super stoked about is um, evaluating misinformation present, present in published literature. Um, now we treat published literature as fact. Um, however, there is a lot of conflicting information in the literature and that doesn't necessarily mean that there's misinformation present in certain cases. It could be the way that something is phrased or the way that a study was done. Um, but knowledge graph embedding and knowledge graph construction can be used to kind of evaluate um, what information may be true, what information is conflicting. Um, and hopefully we can kind of delve into what's happening there in order to, to create a body of literature that is more robust um, and hopefully in the end more true. So with that, I would like to give a huge shout out to my lab for being super supportive, especially uh, my advisor, um, who, with whom I've been working very closely on this project, um, and also to my funding source for this year, which is an NSF training grant for plant and computational sciences. And with that, I will take any questions. Awesome. Thank you so much, Serena, for that wonderful talk. Um,
Do we have any questions from the audience or uh, the panelists? I think uh, Vinod has a question, but I have to take away his. Um, <laughs> oh, okay. Perhaps we know can just uh, we can um, unmute him, uh, them and. Uh, okay, Vinod, um, I've taken away your um, co-host privilege. If you do want to, unless I misunderstood, I might have misunderstood. Let's see. I I don't see a question there yet, but. Oh, here we go. Okay. Um, have you used the global agricultural concept schema in any of your work? No, I have not. And I'm definitely going to have to look into that because we do, we are looking for um, kind of frameworks to, to decide, right? Like what things are entities, what things are relations. And I think that this sounds like, um, from what I understand as a concept schema, that it will be very useful. So thank you for that. Awesome. Um, let's see if we have, have any more questions. And what is the immediate short term kind of step for your project right now? Yeah, so right now what we're trying to do is to build kind of a little prototype graph um, and even uh -huh. on a smaller scale than just the growth defense trade off. So um, if I actually go back uh, uh, it will take me a very long time to go back to the beginning of my slides. But if you remember the figure about the growth defense trade off in those hormones, there are actually two hormones, jasmonic acid and gibberellic acid, which regulate one regulates defense and one regulates growth. Um, and they have kind of documented crosstalk um, between them. And so we're hoping to make a graph that centers on those two entities and the kind of immediate connections between them. Um, just to get a sense of, right, how well does this technique work? Um, you know, where are the holes in our pipeline? How do we retrain all of these tools? Um, and we actually have um, some collaborators that work um, in this discipline. And so we're gonna kind of work with them to evaluate the graph when it comes out. Um, you know, is there information present in the small graph that they, you know, off the top of their head haven't seen before um, or, you know, stuff like that. So um, that's kind of what we're excited about. We're hoping to, to publish on that soon. Awesome, all right. so. Thank you so much, Serena, for this wonderful talk. And uh, if there are any more questions, actually, I see one more question, but we will yeah. send it to you uh, after the symposium, uh, all the unanswered questions. Thank you so much. All right. Thank so, you. Moving on, our next speaker is David Lydon from University of Pennsylvania. Um, is David here? I sure am. Can you hear me OK? Yeah, we can hear Great. it. All right, take it away. Perfect. Um, so let me share screen. And um, I'll also be talking about networks. So Serena, thanks for your talk <laughs> for um, teeing me up. Um, so I'm going to be talking about knowledge network building and its association with deprivation curiosity. Um, so just to give you a bit of background. Um, first, I just want to acknowledge my co-authors and the funding associated with the project. Um, and also um, the STEM Village for, for putting on such an amazing uh, event today. Um, and so I'm interested in curiosity, which we're going to define here as a propensity to seek out novel, complex, and challenging interactions with the world. Um, people who are high in curiosity tend to also be high on life satisfaction and well-being. And this association between curiosity and well-being is often, often interpreted by um, findings that states of curiosity produce novel and broad-ranging thoughts and actions that build into resources that um, uh, lead into our well-being. So if you're someone who tends to be curious, you're doing novel and challenging things, learning new skills um, that help you when you encounter challenges in the future. Um, but we, have, we know very little about what curious practice um, actually looks like. So what does it look like when you're being curious and practicing curiosity? And what exactly are the types of resources that are collected when you're practicing um, curiosity? So trying to um, open the, the black box of this um, idea of resources that are being collected. And the reason that, that we don't know that much about this is because um, the information seeking that we do when we're curious is very open-ended and it's very idiosyncratic. Um, so the goal here is to create a method to open the black box um, of curiosity. 
Um, so to do this, we take a curiosity as knowledge network building approach. In this uh, perspective, we think of uh, knowledge as a network where the nodes or the uh, individual units of a network are um, discrete concepts and then edges or lines are shown between nodes if they are similar, um, if they're concepts that have similarity between them. And so I want you to focus on um, the two different networks that you see here. Um, and I want you to imagine that a person is acting on their curiosity, they've gone out and they've uh, gone on an information seeking expedition. And both these people have created knowledge networks. They both have the same number of nodes in their network. So they both um, encountered the same amount of novel uh, concepts, um, but they look very different in terms of the amount of connections that are between the concepts. So for the person on the left, um, their network is, um, has sampled uh, very diverse concepts. So it has a loose um, kind of organization with very few edges between the uh, concepts. Whereas the person on the right um, has sampled closely connected concepts. Um, so they've created a very tight network. Um, and we call these busybodies and hunters. Um, that's because of work by Dr. Perry Zern. He's an assistant professor of philosophy at American University. Um, and he's um, identified these um, two different styles that link onto this idea of tightness and looseness by looking at how curiosity was used um, throughout you know, a, a ton of literature. Um, but for now, these are just useful labels. Um, you can think of them as ranging from a dimension of tight to loose knowledge networks. So this is all very abstract. So we wanna see if we can operationalize um, this idea in a specific instance of um, knowledge network building. To do that, we recruited 167 participants. Um, here are the age, gender, and race, ethnicity um, breakdowns. Um, they came into the laboratory and they completed a baseline survey where um, we got demographic information, um, but also information about curiosity using standard personality surveys. And then for every day for 21 days, they completed 15 minutes of a knowledge network building task. And the reason we did this for 15 minutes um, every day for 21 days is so that we could get lots of data on each person. So we have over five hours of um, knowledge network building for each individual. Um, to give you some more information about what that task was, um, we essentially asked people to go onto Wikipedia um, every day um, for 21 days for uh, 15 minutes each time. The task was open-ended. They were simply asked to read about whatever they felt like reading. So we were trying to get at this intrinsically motivated information seeking um, that often uh, is, embodies curiosity. So they could read through pages, they could use a search bar to get new concepts, they could open up new tabs, they could click on links. As long as they stayed on Wikipedia for the 15 minutes, um, that's all that we asked them to do. So uh, we also recorded um, the pages they visited and the order in which they visited them. So that's the data we're working with. What is the page you visited and what order did you, did you visit it in? Um, and so we have the, the sample visited over 18,000 unique Wikipedia pages. So it's a lot, a vast amount of data. And so now we need to find a way to take, um, to take this from uh, just Wikipedia pages um, to a knowledge network that's gonna give us insight into um, the type of curious practice that people were doing. So to take uh, Wikipedia and make it into a network, the nodes um, of the network can, uh, are represented as the individual pages. So each page is its own uh, standalone concept. So here you're just looking at the Wikipedia page for dog and the Wikipedia page for Philadelphia. So those are two units um, that will make up a network. But now we have to quantify um, the edges or the similarity between these two pages. And the way that we did it was by um, quantifying the similarity between the text across um, all of the 18,000 um, plus pages. Uh, the more similar the text that was within each um, node, the stronger the link between the two um, pages um, was. But the idea being that if the text is similar, then they're probably exploring similar concepts. And so now for each person, if you just look on the right, this is just an example of what uh, an order someone might have gone through Wikipedia. And they would have started with Marie Curie, Pierre Curie, China, and then Beijing. Um, so we have the pages and the order in which they were visited. But now we also have um, the strength of this association between these um, different um, concepts. So the link between Marie Curie and Pierre Curie is strong. It's very similar, um, but it's not that strong between Pierre Curie and China. So one thing we can do is we can simply take the average of these um, jumps, so how uh, big or small the jumps they're, they're taking, um, to get an average edge weight for each person in our sample. We can then represent that as an average edge weight distribution. Um, and so people on the lower end of this average edge weight 
they um, are practicing curiosity in the style of the busybody. They're making big conceptual leaps as they move from page to page, um, whereas people on the right um, tend to look more like the hunter. They're making small conceptual leaps as they move from page to page. Um, but is this actually working uh, as we think it is? So one way we can do that is just look at um, examples from the left-hand side. So an individual who should um, be making big conceptual leaps as they move from page to page. So here's just a couple of pages from one individual who would be classed as a busybody. They started at uh, physical chemistry. They then went to the Me Too movement. They then went to the Partridge family, then uh, to a page about a uh, primary school in England for some reason, uh, and then to HIP79431, which it turns out is the star. Um, and then to a page about a race car driver. So you have this kind of diverse, seemingly random list of concepts, which tracks with what we were expecting to find at that lower end of the distribution. In contrast, we can look at someone who should be making smaller conceptual leaps as they move from page to page and look at someone with a relatively higher um, average edge weight. And this is just one example of a couple of pages um, from an individual at that end of the um, distribution. And this person looked at the history of Jews in Germany. Um, they then went and read about the Hephep riots, so um, uh, an event in Jewish history. Um, they read about Zionism and then some other um, Jewish thinkers. Um, so you can see that it has much, much more closely connected uh, concepts on this side of the average edge weight. And then you might be wondering about this person all the way over here. Um, so they're a clear outlier with uh, the highest edge weight of all of the networks that were created um, out of our 160 people. Um, and this was like a beautiful proof of concept because this person should be visiting very similar pages as they move through Wikipedia. And um, that's what we find. So this person we're calling a super hunter because why not? Um, and every page they visited had something to do with the British royal family. Um, so they read about Elizabeth II, George VI, uh, Edward VIII, George V, and the only page they visited um, that wasn't about a member of the royal family was about a ship that was named Queen Elizabeth II. So this was a really nice um, proof of concept that we we're, were able to take this kind of vast amount of information about really open-ended and complex um, idiosyncratic information-seeking behavior and uh, quantify it in a meaningful way. Um, another way we can see if this is working is we can ask, um, does average edge weight show um, associations with existing measures of curiosity, so how we typically measure curiosity. And so here we're using um, a, a curiosity scale um, that captured between person differences in curious curiosity at the baseline survey. Um, in particular, we looked at how, how much people endorsed whether they were high or low in deprivation sensitivity. So people who are high in deprivation sensitivity, they seek information to escape the tension of not knowing something. So they hate not having the whole picture. And so um, when people are, have this experience this deprivation sensitivity, they have this determination to continue um, information seeking until a knowledge gap is filled. So this results in a persistent and effortful form of exploration about a specific topic. Um, and so as you would expect, people who are higher in deprivation curiosity are higher in the average edge weight. So they look more like the hunters. That was a really nice um, validity check that we are capturing something about curiosity as we think about it. Um, so we can operationalize curious practice as a knowledge, uh, net, as a knowledge network, network building practice. Um, and doing this, we can characterize different types of network structure um, using graph theory to get at individual differences in curious practice. Here I just talked about average edge weight, um, but we can also use things like clustering and path length, and these all show meaningful associations with deprivation sensitivity. And so by doing this, um, we're opening the black box of what the resources that are being collected during uh, curious practice are, um, which is going to help us detail the link between curious practice and well-being in future work. Um, so that was just a taste of the project. Um, you can find more information um, um, with our preprint on SciArchive, um, which actually just got accepted yesterday, which I'm really excited about. And you can also check out my new lab that I just set up at, in the Annenberg School for Communication at uh, the University of Pennsylvania. And um, thanks. Thank you so much, David, for this amazing talk. Um, do we have any questions from the audience or the panelists? I have a question, but maybe I can just go first while the audience is thinking about that. So sure. this might be irrelevant. So if it is, please feel free to call me out. But um, is there something about what you're working on in terms of like the deprivation curiosity and the like being a hunter, so on and so forth, mm -hmm. and the online radicalization that we see now, right? On YouTube, for instance, right? If you follow like 
right wing videos or alt right videos, you kind of enter a path of like just self radicalization, right? Have you looked into that or do you have plans to look into that and how that's associated with the type of behavior that you're studying? Yeah, that's a really interesting question. And it's something we're hoping to look at next. So we used Wikipedia, which is actually very different to anything else on the internet right now. It's not, it's an open encyclopedia. It's not for profit. It doesn't necessarily lead you down certain um, avenues of exploration, but there are other websites out there that kind of put you on this um, pathway um, and encourage you to kind of keep delving down into a topic until you end up in a, an information silo like the type you're, you're suggesting. And so um, the next step is to look at how different platforms, so not just looking at people on Wikipedia, but looking at people across different platforms to see if different platforms would encourage more or less hunter busybody like behavior. Yeah, great question. Yeah, absolutely. I think that would be really interesting, actually. I realize that just with my own habits, right, like mm -hmm. on YouTube, like it just keeps me kind of like within the same kind of, I guess, like echo chamber a little bit. Like, mm -hmm. and I mean, I, I find comfort in it, but I, I'm just curious to see how we can study that. And I would be super interested in seeing the result for that. Yeah, he does. <clears throat> but just before that, I would be that sort of that typical white man with the, I've got a, a comment, not a question, but it's literally just to say, <laughs> I think it's so amazing that you can, that you can study curiosity in yeah. a quantitative way. I, my mind is just blown by that. I think it's so cool. But anyway, fine, I can that question. <laughs> I was just wondering if, well, two questions actually. Um, the first one was to see if, if it's possible for someone who has more of a um, busy body behavior to then become a hunter and vice versa. Uh, and the second question is, um, is it possible to identify potential patterns within the busy body behavior that we are not at first looking at and then may explain that sort of seemingly random, um, you know, kind of um, curiosity pattern? Yeah. Great questions. So um, here we're kind of thinking of, about, we're, I'm talking about them as if they're two binary things. That's of course not the case. Some people who, um, it, it's kind of a, a long continuum of creating uh, tight versus loose networks. Right. Um, and what we found, which I didn't present today, is if you just break down the 21 days into uh, three week periods and you create a network for each person for each week, there is fluctuation in the extent to which a person is would be considered like a hunter or a busybody. So there is fluctuations in the extent to which a person is going to express um, going after like uh, tightly uh, related concepts versus loosely related concepts. And um, we also collected daily diary data alongside this task. So one of the questions was asking about people's sensation seeking. So the amount, uh, the extent to which during the day they're going after new and exciting and novel experiences. And so on, on during weeks where they were going out into the world and experiencing new, new things on those weeks they tended to have more of the busybody uh, like um, structures which suggests that um, kind of in line with your second question it's like maybe these are just really different thing that, things that they've experienced during the day that week for example that would explain how they're making links between these concepts um, that aren't in the investigator's mind or in the mind of the algorithm that's saying this page is similar this one is not yes. um, um, yeah, and I guess also asking, we didn't ask the participants here. So it, it, with reference to your second question, they may see a train, a train of thought driving this disparate search um, yeah. that we're not getting at by relying on a computer to tell us what's similar or not. So that, that's a really interesting um, way to think about it. One way we're exploring that is um, we're interviewing an artist who tends to integrate um, uh, very different ideas, at least in, on face value. But in talking with her about uh, her process, she tends to um, jump back and forth, um, uh, jump back and forth, but there's meaning behind why she's making those jumps. Um, mm -hmm. So that's where Becca came in, just for anyone who's interested in the art side of things. Cool, thank you. Mm -hmm. Awesome. All right, if there are no more questions, let's thank David once more. Thank you so much for the amazing so talk. And if there are any more questions, we will make sure to follow up with you. All right, Great. awesome, David, thank you. Our next speaker is Javier Garcia from University of California, Davis. Uh, is Javier here? All right. Yes, there we go. I'm here. <laughs> All right, take it away. Start. All right, can everybody hear me? Yep. Okay, perfect. 
Uh, hi, everyone. So my name is Javier Garcia, and I'm going to be talking to you about the work that I've been doing as a graduate student at the University of California, Davis. I'm a, um, entering my fifth year in the PhD program, where we study fungal pathogenesis, particularly fungal pathogenesis of the central nervous system, So, um, which I'll get into in a little bit. So fungi are the major, we study the major pathogens that cause fungal meningitis. And so fungi are often underappreciated for what they do, um, especially in mycosis. And so it's more than just a foot fungus. So the disease pathologies range from mild skin irritation to disseminated disease, which I'll talk to you about uh, in a little bit. Um, there's about 1.5 million deaths resulting from fungal infections but only 300 out of the 1.3 million species of fungi are pathogens. Um, and there's limited treatments to these fungi, or I'm sorry, there's limited treatments to these, these, these fungal diseases, um, limited diagnostics, um, as well as the basic mechanisms of disease. Um, and only until recently, um, the fungal field is getting a little bit more traction, but the molecular mechanisms of how it causes disease are still very lacking. And so one of the pathogens that I study is called, um, the disease is called valley fever. And so what valley fever is, it's a fatal, potentially fatal fungal infection caused by the coccidioides spore. And it's really important because um, it's actually found uh, essentially in my backyard. And so um, it's uh, caused by the inhalation of the spores that I mentioned. Um, it's predominantly found in the southwestern part of the U.S. and in Cent and California's Central Valley, which is a major agricultural hub. So people who work in agriculture um, uh, construction are ex extremely susceptible to acquiring this disease. And so when the soil is excavated and the, uh, the spores are exposed, people breathe in these spores. Um, <clears throat> and primarily it establishes that as a lung infection. So people breathe in these spores and the fungi goes through a morphological change. And so um, it, it change, the spores change into what's called an endospore. These endospores grow into uh, essentially a sack of um, more endospores called spherules. Those spherules break open and the cycle continues and uh, it disseminates uh, into the other parts of the body. And so some of those parts, oops, some of those parts that um, are affected are, so it's a primarily lung, it's a primarily, it's a lung infection. Um, and so once it establishes infection in the lung, it can spread to other parts of the body, such as the skin and muscles, the bone, bone and joints, um, the lungs, like I mentioned. And one of the most devastating parts of the disease is um, infection of the central nervous system. And so, it's classified into three, the manifestation is classified into three major parts. The first part is uh, asymptomatic, where people have a positive serology, meaning that they have antigen in their body, but they have no uh, symptoms of having coxy, or I'm sorry, valley fever. And so 60% of the population that acquires this disease have no symptoms. And so we've, we've seen asymptomatic a lot in the news regarding COVID. And so this is a similar manifestation. And so uh, people who do get uh, pulmonary um, coccidiomycosis, um, you'll find in x-ray findings these, these uh, tumor-like uh, projections in CT scans with a positive serology. And about 50 to 75% of people um, have this manifestation. And like I mentioned, the disseminate disease is when it spreads to other parts of the body. Um, one, about one to five percent of people acquire disseminated disease and once it is uh, disseminated it's very hard to treat and if it's not treated it's 100 percent fatal. And so one of the approaches we want to study uh, that we're using to study uh, the coccidioides is to study the proteins that mediate um, host invasion, uh, migration, migration, adhesion, and so on. And so to date, not much is known about the various virulence factors that, <coughs> excuse me, that uh, comprise uh, this organism. And like I mentioned before, there's no, 
there's actually no um, pathways involved or there's no pathways identified involved in disease. And so one of the approaches, like I mentioned, is we want to study the uh, proteins associated with um, disease. And the proteins that are associated with disease are usually found on the outside of the cell. And so these are extremely important because they can be used as biomarkers, um, vaccine targets, more recently antivirulence therapeutics where we can target just the disease causing aspect of the, uh, of the organism without causing um, evolution or uh, drug resistance. And so um, we want to uh, characterize the surface topology of coccidioides. And one of the major focuses that we want to focus in on when we're looking at these uh, large proteomic sets is looking primarily at uh, host invasion and cell damage um, and dissemination. Because uh, like I mentioned, these are the first proteins that are gonna be mediating the uh, interface between the host and the, the fungi. And so to start, what we are using is we're using a, um, a particular strain of coccidioides that has been maintained in the parasitic life cycle. So like I mentioned before, it's usually found as a mold in the soil. And when the uh, mold breaks free and the uh, arthrokinidia or spores are breathed in, they undergo this morphological change in the lungs. And so we have a strain that remains in this morphological state, this uh, spiral endospore phase, which I'll call the SE phase. Um, and it's been maintained since the 60s. And so it's really important because we've demonstrated that it's still virulent despite being cultured for over 50 years. Um, it's, we're able to compare the proteome of this uh, laboratory strain with the uh, parent strain that it came from. And it facilitates our studies because it's also a biosafety level two pathogen. So there's no arthrokinidia stage where a person could breathe it. And so it's easy to grow. There's no need for uh, BSL-3 equipment. Um, and finally, it's, this SE stage is the disease state that's found in the host. And so it's really important that we have this strain to study and begin our surface proteome studies. And so essentially, one of the techniques that we're employing is uh, the, a method called trypsin shaving. And so trypsin shaving, um, essentially, you treat your cells with trypsin, and the trypsin cleaves at um, specific residues on proteins. And so we're able to collect the cleaved proteins, concentrate them, and we can run them on a gel. And so what, why we want to run it on a gel is because we want to see different, differential banding patterns with two different treatments. So PBS is just a normal buffer. We don't expect to see any cleavage of proteins. And with trypsin, we're expecting to see uh, proteins that are, are, are cleaved off the surface. We can then take those proteins and uh, sequence them using mass spectrometry, and we can analyze what those proteins are. And so when I did that, um, we were testing different conditions, and we were able to see that in the trypsin treatment, we saw a differential band that's about um, 40 kilodaltons in size. And so um, this band represents something that is being cleaved off of the treatment. And so we cut that band out and we sent it off for mass spec sequencing. But um, you may, if, if you're familiar with uh, cell culture techniques, um, trypsin is used to uh, uh, cleave or uh, separate cells from the surface. So it's a very harsh treatment. And so um, we want to make sure that the trypsin treatment isn't breaking open the cells and releasing proteins from the inside because we're only interested on the proteins on the outside. And so um, this just shows that after, before treatment and after treatment, these cells um, remain mostly, they remain intact, they remain the spherical shape. And so, um, so that confirms that we're, we don't have any mass cleavage of cells uh, with resulting in a mass uh, leakage of those intracellular proteins. And so when we did that, we found in that banding pattern, in that band, we found uh, 12 proteins of interest. And so um, these four that are highlighted in yellow are, um, have been previously identified in the literature as immunoreactive. And so that means it, the proteins are likely located on the surface, on, on the outside, they're being secreted, 
and they have an immune effect on the host. And so um, going back to my hypothesis, which is these surface exposed proteins um, are virulence factors um, that mediate cell damage. So uh, an aspartyl protease has been known to cause cell damage um, and other fungi um, adhesion. Um, this carbohydrate binding domain uh, could be potentially involved in uh, carb uh, adhesion or immune evasion. So there was this superoxide dismutase, which is a protein that's also virulence factor in other fungi. And then interestingly, these other proteins that I didn't highlight, highlight in yellow have um, cytosolic functions. And so in the literature, it's been uh, noted that there are some proteins that have dual roles um, and they're called moonlighting proteins and they can perform uh, functions at the surface that are not, I guess, what they're intended to do. Um, and so they can have roles in virulence, in drug resistance, and so on. But we're primarily interested in the immune reactive proteins that uh, have been previously uh, been identified. Um, but this is only a really small subset of proteins. It, it's not representative of the whole proteome of proteins that are found on the cell. So to do that, we I essentially used a more shotgun approach where um, instead of running it on a gel, looking for a differential banding pattern, um, I had, I submitted my entire contents of cleaved protein to the uh, mass, the, the proteomic cord to analyze. And so we, we can essentially uh, compare that with the, our uh, control, which is the PBS control, and sort of subtract the proteins that we see in both and analyze the specific proteins found in one sample over the other. And so when we did that, um, uh, we used a, uh, a, a program to um, analyze the proteins to find a signal sequence. Um, so a lot of proteins have a signal sequence, which is destined uh, a secretion signal to be excreted outside the cell. And so, um, in our PBS control, there was um, about three proteins that did have a extracellular signal, which comprised about not about 1.1% or I'm sorry, about 1% of uh, extracellular predictions. But in the TRIPS and treatment, um, it had the highest percentage of extracellular prediction. And so that further validated that our approach uh, with analyzing these proteins um, um, it's, an, it's a valid approach to study these, uh, the surface topology. And so using these proteomic sets, so you get these long protein lists and so what do you do? And so one of the ways to kind of uh, almost going back to the network um, talks, we can put these into a program and analyze what proteins are interacting with each other and um, we can get a general idea of what pathways, what general functions these gene sets are doing. And so uh, with this gene ontology analysis, uh, we found that the, in the trypsin treatment, uh, most of the proteins that we found had uh, catalytic activity, peptidase activity, hydrolase activity, meaning that these proteins are you know, chewing up something. And that's very characteristic of fungi. They secrete proteins outside their um, outside their cell to cause damage to to survive and digest on the outside and absorb um, the nutrients. And so this again uh, further validated that the proteins that we're analyzing are have some sort of uh, catalytic activity. And so um, and so in studying the um, virulence factors, we decided to look at one particular virulence factor or predicted virulence factor in this case um, <coughs> that's also secreted. And so we're taking lessons from another fungal pathogen, which is called uh, uh, Cryptococcus neoformans. And so that's the leading uh, organism that causes fungal meningitis. And so it has the ability to cross the blood brain barrier and infect the central nervous system. And so, and there's a lot of research regarding cryptococcus and its ability to cross the central nervous system. But again, there's zero studies on, um, uh, on coccidioides and how it can cross the central nervous system. 
And so one of the uh, previous papers from my, our lab, um, they identified a protein that's able to cross the blood brain barrier. And so one of the experiments that they did before I joined the lab was they actually cloned in, or they put in this uh, gene, this protein, I'm sorry, this, yeah, they, so they put this gene in uh, Saccharomyces cerevisiae, so yeast. And so yeast doesn't have the capability of crossing the blood-brain barrier. Um, but in this graph, when uh, Saccharomyces is expressing this protein, it gains the ability to cross the blood-brain barrier. And so we're using this uh, in static model of the human blood-brain barrier where we um, have our uh, fungi of interest. We uh, co-culture it with um, a cell line that represents the blood-brain barrier. And then we can monitor crossing uh, based on how many cells grow and cross. Um, and so with cryptococcus, this protein was clearly involved in uh, crossing the blood-brain barrier. And so we were able to do that with a similar protein in coccidioides. And so we had the hypothesis that the similar protein, this homologue, is going to be able to cross the blood brain barrier. However, when we expressed this um, protein in Saccharomyces, we found that there was no significant difference in crossing compared to Cryptococcus uh, uh, Saccharomyces without uh, any of uh, Saccharomyces with that's not expressing the protein compared to Saccharomyces expressing the protein. And this is um, Cryptococcus that has the ability to cross. Um, and so what we conclude is that, and this is a similar um, graph to this one where I extended the, um, the time, uh, the incubation time to see if we could see a larger effect. However, every time we did these experiments, we had a non-significant result uh, suggesting that this metalloprotease, this protein, does not gain the ability to cross the blood brain barrier. So, and, but that's just one protein. So, um, to conclude, we established that trypsin shaving is a suitable method to study the surface proteome, and that gene ontology uh, can reveal the major pathways associated with the, the catalytic proteins. And so for future work, we want to assess the virulence of other potential hits, especially hits that we keep seeing time, over, time and time again with these gain of function assays. And it's particularly important to use these gain of function assays because it's a pretty dangerous pathogen to work with. So we can essentially just take, interrogate one part of the organism um, and see, assess its uh, function. Um, and with that, um, I'd like to thank the funding for this, uh, for this work, all the people who uh, have helped me throughout this uh, process, and especially for the STEM Village. Uh, this has been a great opportunity to talk to other LGBTQ plus uh, scientists, and I'm very excited to, to know a lot of what you are doing around the world. And so with that, I'll take any questions that you may have. Thank you so much, Javier, for this amazing talk. Uh, we have questions, so I'll just start highlighting those. All right, so interesting that most MS identified peptides are enzymes. Is there a chance that post translationally modified extracellular proteins could not be identified by trypsin treatment since acetylation could often act, act as a signal to interact with host proteins? So that's a great question. And so um, there's not much known about the post-translational modifications in coccid And so one of, the, but one of the things that we do see, at least in these protein sets, is we do see a lot of glycosylation um, enzymes. And so we know that the surface of the cell has a lot of uh, glycosylated proteins, but what their function is, we really don't, don't know. And so that's, this at least opens up some of the research or opens up some of the more work for us to understand what is, what is going on at the surface. Does that answer the question? <laughs> awesome. Uh, I think uh, Cameron has a question. Cameron, go ahead. Hi. Um, yeah, that was really interesting. Um, I did a master's on parasites and the fact that it was a moonlighting, so I thought it was really cool. 
My question is, however, you showed a map of the distribution. Um, it's really similar to West Nile virus. I'm just wondering, is the effects of climate change causing a greater spread of um, cockyoids and therefore an increased incidence of infection? Yes, yeah, so that's a great point. Um, so in California, we have been experiencing a lot of drought and the cases have actually been increasing over the years, which is something that we, we don't want to see. And so we, there's a lot of, um, there's a lot of, uh, I guess, looking, a lot of people have looked into how climate change has affected um, the rates of infection. And so I would say that climate change does play a big role in the number of infections, especially when it's found in an arid climate. Um, the more arid it is, the more, um, the more uh, fungi are able to grow in the soil, I guess. Does that answer the, your question? <laughs> Uh, yeah, thank you. Uh, yes, yes. Okay. <laughs> All right, last question. Uh, I'd be interested uh, to hear if you think unknown virulence mechanisms similar to these might also be found in spore forming bacteria. So the mechanisms of actually, I don't know much about the other virulence factors in the spore forming bacteria, especially when it relates to dissemination, but um, in our lab, we also studied uh, receptors on the host side. And so these receptors are actually found or used by a variety of different pathogens. Um, and this is in regards to crossing the blood brain barrier. And so a lot of, so fungi, um, parasites like um, malaria, uh, uh, I can't think, plasmodium falciparum, um, several other um, bacteria are able to use the same receptor. And so that kind of suggests that there's a similar mechanism being used by um, bacteria as well. Awesome. Thank you so much, Javier, for this amazing talk. So yeah, I think, yeah, we just move on to All the right. next one. If, if Let's we... move on to the next talk then. So our next speaker, maybe the final speaker, uh, is Arthur Tinoco from University of Puerto Rico. Um, is Arthur here? Oh. Awesome. All right, Arthur, here. take it away. Hey, take it hey, can away. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. All right, thank you. Well, thank you for this tremendous opportunity to, um, to present here for the, uh, the Sem Village Symposium. So I'm going to share my screen. Can you see my presentation? Yep. Okay, so today I'm going to talk about work that I've been doing in my laboratory um, over the last few years, uh, funded by an NIH SC1 grant. Um, the title of my talk is Synergizing Titanium and Iron Chelators to Decrease the Bioavailability of Iron in Cancer Cells. So in my laboratory, we focus on iron because we're interested in looking at um, a method to uh, a broad drug design where we can target um, an agent that is responsible for the proliferation and potential angiogenesis of cancer cells. And so um, one of the things that we have really been keen on is trying to explore ways in which we can attenuate the bioavailability of iron within cancer cells. And that is because cancer cells have a greater demand for iron than normal cells. So we just want to give you an overview of how iron um, enters into the cells and this idea of a homeostatic balance of the iron that goes within the cell and is exported. So there's an important protein um, called transferrin that exists in our blood. It's present at about 30 micromolar. It binds two um, ions of iron three, and then it gets recognized by the transferrin receptor, and that uh, triggers a process known as endocytosis. Um, a combination of acidification and also a reduction event results in the iron um, being released as iron 2 plus being shuttled out of the endosome via the divalent metal transporter. And so then that forms into a sort of a uh, this uh, dynamic equilibrium of a labile iron pool. Part of that pool gets distributed to um, the protein ferritin, which will store the iron. 
a, a significant amount of that iron gets utilized. Um, for instance, a protein um, called ribonucleotide reductase um, is responsible for the building blocks that leads to DNA synthesis. But there are also a certain amount of that iron that gets exported out of uh, the ferroporin protein. And so what we have is this balance between the amount of iron that's going in the cell, that's iron three, and the amount of iron that gets um, released. What we see in cancer cells is there's a loss of this balance. And so we have a number of um, cancer hallmarks that are due to um, this dependency on iron, this higher requirement for iron. We have an overexpression of the transfer receptor because there is a need for more iron to be brought in. There is less export of the iron, there's less storage, far more utility. So we also see an overexpression of iron dependent proteins like ribonucleotide reductase. So there has been great interest in the use of iron chelators for anti-cancer therapy. A number of iron-2 and iron-3 chelators um, that have been designed for other applications, for instance, iron overload diseases, are being repurposed as potential anti-cancer drug agents. So they operate via a number of proposed mechanisms. Some can prevent iron uptake in cancer cells, so this is an activity that is extracellular. Some can deplete iron from cancer cells. Others remove iron from sites that regulate cell function, and there are those that inhibit iron-dependent pathways without necessarily removing iron from, from the cells. Collectively, these mechanisms contribute to decreasing the bioavailability, the functional iron. So um, in our talk, we're going to look at, to an extent at um, an effort that's been done to deplete an iron-dependent pathway. So I mentioned ribonucleotide reductase. So this is an enzyme that is iron dependent and it catalyzes the conversion of, di of, me, of nucleotide diphosphates to deoxynucleotide diphosphates. Essentially, the building blocks for DNA replication and repair. So the, structurally, the enzyme is a dimer of dimer. So we have this alpha-2 dimer uh, constitutes the R1 unit. So it's the bigger component of the, um, this enzyme. It contains the catalytic site and you have this other component, the beta-2 dimer, which is the, referred to as the R2 unit. And this has a very important di-iron cofactor site, um, which is responsible for the generation of an important tyrosyl radical. Because the chemistry that's involved here is a radical-induced process. So the radical is initiated in this, um, in this beta-2 site, and it gets shuttled to the R1 site when a substrate enters into the, um, into the actual catalytic site. All right, so I just want to highlight here um, the di-iron um, cofactor site. And so when the iron binds into the site, um, the iron actually goes in oxidation events. So we, we transition from iron 2 plus in the reducing environment of the cell. Um, now it gets transformed to iron 3 plus. And in that process, it actually affects a nearby tyrosine and it converts it into a tyrosyl radical. And the very interesting thing is that we can actually monitor this particular radical using a technique called electron paramagnetic resonance. This particular radical is um, EPR active, and so we can actually um, detect this. There are a number of specific R2 inhibitors, and within this family of inhibitors of this particular enzyme, there are a number of iron chelators that have been explored for this potential capacity. So in my work, what we try to do is fuse iron chelation using some of these strategies that have already been explored, but couple that with titanium. Um, so there's another metal that we're gonna talk about in a moment. The idea is that we want to inhibit the, um, the bioavailability of iron for an anti-cancer application. So why do we incorporate titanium into our drug design? Well, interestingly, titanium-4 shares many similar chemical properties to iron-3. And as a result, titanium can bind to many of the same biological ligands. Uh, it has been observed that titanium in blood, when it's actually released in blood, um, it's bound by serum transferrin. And this protein, as I mentioned previously, is the protein responsible for the cellular uptake of iron 3 plus. And it's believed to potentially play a role in the transport and biodistribution of titanium in the human body. So via that interaction, titanium is not believed to be toxic. However, depending on the coordination chemistry, now that can then fine tune the activity of the titanium, where titanium can then become highly potent anti-proliferative or cytotoxic species. And in this vein, um, it's believed to be able to exhibit these properties by uh, potentially inhibiting DNA synthesis, 
um, inhibiting certain uh, key intracellular proteins, and it has been shown to cause apoptosis at any phase of cell division. So we seek to exploit this property of titanium, something that is not necessarily um, you know, in our bodies is necessarily toxic, but exploiting the coordination chemistry to take advantage of that potential uh, and coupling that with iron chelation. And so what we've been interested in doing is um, looking at how serum transferrin coordinates iron and titanium to give a structural insight into potential ligands that can help us to design titanium compounds that then within the cellular environment can release the titanium and essentially become um, weaponized. And so uh, we've actually have solved the crystal structure for titanium um, being bound by the transferrin um, protein. And uh, there are similarities with, with, with how the iron is bound, but it's also some key differences, which I'm gonna highlight here. So this is what is referred to as the canonical form of how metals are believed to be bound to this protein, um, where iron is coordinated to, to four amino acid residues, two tyrosines, and aspartate, a histidine. And there is a synergistic anion carbonate, which helps to satisfy the coordination of the metal and helps to stabilize that metal. The binding of the iron actually induces a, a, a major conformation change that stabilizes the protein and actually uh, helps to be recognized by the transferrin receptor. Well, the titanium, uh, there is an important difference, and that is that um, the, it's believed that a small molecule um, present in our blood, citrate, um, can help to shuttle the titanium to the protein, but also serve as an additional synergistic anion that can help to stabilize the metal bound to this protein. The presence of this citrate essentially blocks binding of the aspartate and the histidine, and it results in some important differences in terms of the coordination to this protein and the changes that are associated with this protein. Nonetheless, it's believed that the protein is able to, to transport this metal into our, into our cells. But what we're actually interested in is focusing on the key coordination features and exploiting this difference in ligand affinity for a potential therapeutic effect. And so we've been focusing on uh, small molecules that are chemical transfer mimetics. So here we're highlighting again the coordination of iron to this, the metal binding sites of serum transferrin. And we've identified a number of small molecules that can mimic the coordination of the protein to this uh, metal. So for instance, uh, to the right here, we have this ligand, um, it's abbreviated as HBED, is a hexadentate ligand, which that means it can coordinate iron at six different sites, and it shows very similar coordination um, modality as um, transferrin. And then to the left, we have uh, another small molecule, uh, it's the ferroxorus. Um, it is a tridentate ligand. Um, this particular molecule is used for um, at, commercially as a uh, uh, something that can treat um, iron excess. And so when it coordinates to iron, you require two of this molecules to satisfy the coordination of the metal. Both of these uh, form uh, iron complexes that are a very high um, binding constants. But what we would like to establish is we would like to use these ligands to prepare titanium compounds. These titanium compounds being bound in a manner that's very similar to the way the iron is bound. But the idea is that we want that these compounds be inert in the outside of the cellular environment. But once entering into the cellular environment, then a process known as, uh, that we refer to as transmetallation is induced due to the interaction between the titanium chemical transfer mimetic compounds and the label ion pool that's present within the cellular environment. So here's just a, a cartoon representation of this process. So the, the label ion pool consists of dominantly of iron two plus, but also a good uh, amount of iron three. So a number of questions that we've tried to uh, uh, explore in these recent years is, can the trans chemical transfer mimetic ligands transmetallate titanium for iron in the tr intracellular environment? And if so, do these complexes inhibit the activity of the iron-dependent protein uh, ribonucleotide reductase? So one of the things that we wanted to establish in, on the bench top was to just explore this idea of the feasibility of transmetallation. So here we just have a representation of the titanium complex of the ferroxorus. And what we did was to explore its interaction with the label source of iron. So we use iron citrate, which is a, a good representative of some of a low molecular weight label iron three source. And we probe the um, potential transmetallation re reaction uh, via a number of spectroscopic techniques. 
Uh, one of the really helpful um, approaches that we did was to use electrospray ionization, QTOF mass spectrometry to really probe um, uh, mechanistically what is going on. And so what we were able to see, so we monitored this over the um, time frame of hours, um, was that uh, soon after mixing the titanium complexes with the label iron three source, we have the formation of these ternary um, intermediates. And then those ternary intermediates dissociate and they result in the expected um, sort of thermodynamic products where you have the transmetallation event where the chemical transfer magnetic ligand releases titanium and it binds the iron. Uh, so what's very interesting to us is that uh, this is something that uh, as soon as we mix the titanium complexes with the iron source, we have immediate reaction. But it does take several hours until we reach what we would consider the expected uh, product. But it's very interesting that we have these intermediates that do form. And so we've explored um, this process for, um, uh, for diferoxyl, but also for the h -fed, um ligand and other of our chemical transfer and mimetic um, compounds, uh, just to get a general sense of the feasibility of these, of the transmetallation event. So this helped us to, to, uh, to realize that yes, this type of chemistry is possible, but can it actually occur within cells? So um, we had previously characterized the antiproliferative properties of our compounds. And um, one type of cell, cell lines that these compounds are quite effective against our leukemia cells. So we decided to focus on the Urcat leukemia cells as a case study to really explore the impact of our compounds on the iron within the cells. So here I have a, just a, a brief representation of the IC50 values um, of these compounds. Um, so we see that the titanium complexes have a greater potency in terms of affecting the proliferation of this particular um, cancer cell line. Uh, we've also done uh, cytotoxicity assays to show that these uh, compounds are cytotoxic. So we do see the, this combination of antiproliferative and a cytotoxic effect. A very interesting um, observation that we've made was that when we supplement the uh, cell line, so the leukemia cell lines, but also other cell lines that we have worked with, with some amount of labile iron, what we have seen is that the cells are now more resistant towards our complexes. Um, the, the potency of the complexes decreases. So what we wanted to explore was if introducing our compounds to our, the cells, we have an, an effect on the iron that is available to activate the ribonucleotide reductase enzyme. So the idea is that um, here is the, the di-iron um, cofactor site requires the binding of two iron two um, ions and the presence of molecular oxygen uh, in order to form the very important tyrosyl radical. The idea is that in the presence of our titanium complexes, that should, in essence, make the iron unavailable or less available um, in, 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 by making it functionally inert. And so we should, and then, be able to observe this by using electron paramagnetic resonance. What we should observe is a decrease in the G2 signal that is associated with the presence of the tyrosyl radical. So in order to probe this possibility, we use whole cell um, electron paramagnetic resonance uh, study of probing the URCAT cells in the presence of the absence of our compounds. And so here we're literally um, probing the signal, the G2 signal that's as associated with the tyrosyl radical. So what we observe here is a subset of our data. Um, this was collected after three hours of treatment of the cell lines is the signal that is due to the untreated cells. And then in the presence of our titanium complexes, we see that the signal is attenuated. It does not go away completely, but we see a significant increase. I believe it's a, about a 75% um, decrease um, for the two titanium compounds. And we see a comparable decrease for just the uh, metal-free ligands as well. So this was work that was done um, in collaboration with Professor Lisa Tomat at the University of Arizona. Another interesting thing that we wanted to explore was the impact of our compounds on the um, iron that's present within cells. And so here we were probing a specific population of the intracellular iron pool, which is the high strand iron three pool. And so what we observe is a very uh, distinct behavior between the h bed compounds and the diferoxyphorus compounds. So uh, this signal here is due to the um, high spin iron three in the untreated cells. 
in the presence of the titanium diferoxys or the metal free diferoxys, we actually see no change in that signal. However, for the titanium HVET or the metal free HVET signal, we actually see an increase in this um, in this pool. So it's clear that these um, complexes um, affect the iron in ways that are distinct, but nonetheless, that impact on the iron appears to still um, be significant in terms of, of inhibiting the activation of the ribonucleotide reductase enzyme. Another experiment that we wanted to, to um, explore was that we already had previously established that these compounds are apoptotic, but we wanted to understand if, uh, their ability to potentially affect the cell cycle. So we use a flow cytometry as a, as a gauge of understanding the effect that we can have on the cell cycle, and we did a time-dependent study here. So what we have, um, the top panel is the effect of the diphoroxyrus and the titanium diphoroxyrus compound over time, and compared to just um, cells that have not been treated with anything. And the, the bottom set of panels, we have the effect of the HVED and titanium HVED complexes over time. And so what we observed was that um, at 10 hours, we start to see that there is a cell cycle arrest at the S phase. Um, and then at 24 hours, that becomes pronounced for both the uh, metal-free diphoroxyrus ligand and also the titanium diphoroxyrus uh, compound. We observe um, for the HVED complexes that at the 10 hour time point, uh, we also see this arrest of the S phase, but that arrest uh, seems to um, decrease by the time we reach 24 hours. So there's this time dependent um, behavior that we observe. But what's very interesting to us is that this, this data is consistent with what we've been observing in terms of the ability to inhibit the uh, activity of the ribonucleotide reductase. Because by arresting at this S phase, we're essentially, um, is indicative of an inhibition of DNA replication. All right, so to conclude, uh, we were able to show that the combination of titanium cytotoxicity and appropriate iron chelators, in, in this case, the chemical transfer mimetic ligands, can effectively alter the label iron pool and attenuate the ribonucleotide reductase activity. It appears that the iron chelation by these chemical transfer mimetic ligands can lead to different changes to the intracellular iron pool. In our current studies, what we're trying to do is really elucidate the full details of the molecular mechanisms involved of um, corresponding to the titanium chemical transfer mimetic antimoliferative and cytotoxic behavior. What we're actually trying to look at is what is that titanium doing? And we have some clues, um, but we really wanted to focus here as on the effect on the iron itself within the cellular environment. So I would like to, to thank uh, the many um, students that contributed to this project. So a number of uh, graduate students that were very influential in terms of the structural studies and also the fundamental cellular work. Um, those that have graduated and now are colleagues of the lab, former undergraduate students um, that have now moved on to, to, to graduate school, um, the sources of funding. So the one of the major sources was the NIH SC1 grant. Um, now more recently, we've been rewarded with the NIH R21 grant to support this work. And also very importantly, we'd like to thank the Puerto Rico Science, Technology, and Research Trust grant. And then here I would like to acknowledge the, uh, the different members of my laboratory. Thank you very much. Any questions? Thank you so much, Arthur, for the amazing talk. So we do have one question in the chat box that I can read. Does okay. the cell cycle rest correspond with epigenetic changes that may be influenced by iron-dependent enzymes? So we really need to look at this, um, what impact we're having in the genome, also what impact we're potentially having in the protein. We have, uh, we have not yet explored those uh, that particular aspect of the, the mechanism involved. Um, it could be, um, but we, we, we need to do those experiments. We're actually very interested in looking at, are we actually, in addition to, you know, potentially affecting the label iron pool, are we actually directly affecting the ribonucleotide reductase? And that's something that we're also interested in exploring. So we're now um, expressing this protein to do direct studies with that enzyme and see how is it that we're truly in, um, inhibiting this enzyme? So yeah, so we, there's work to be done there. Awesome. Let me see if we have more questions. I think that's it. And I encourage uh, our audience to reach out to Arthur um, if they have any more questions. And with that, we're wrapping up the session and the symposium. So I think Matthew would like to give uh, some closing remarks. 
Um, yeah, thanks, Mehmet. And uh, thank you, Arthur. And thank you to all of the other um, people speaking in the session and throughout the entire day. Um, I just want to say how amazing the day has been, how wonderful it's been to see not just the Scottish community, which was the initial aim of, of this event, but you know, the global LGBTQ plus STEM community coming together and you know, hearing things that were so interesting and hearing things that were heartwarming, things that were difficult, things that, you know, areas where we still need to work. Um, it was just, it was a really wonderful event. And I just want to thank everybody so much for participating so wholeheartedly and to all of the organizers who worked to bring this together and to make it happen. So thank you very, very much. And I hope we can do something again in the not too distant future. Maybe not quite this long, <laughs> something a bit shorter, <laughs> but I hope we can do future events and all come together again. Um, and yeah, with that, I would just like to say, um, stay safe, stay well. Um, I hope you have a great weekend and thank you very much. Yeah, I'd like just, I'd just like to echo um, Matthew's remarks and uh, thank you to Matthew and all the organization community for leading this effort. And uh, it's been so amazing to connect with uh, the global LGBTQ plus community. Uh, and uh, yeah, uh, I hope to see you all soon in the very near future again in another format. I don't know if anybody else wants to give any remark, but. Well, if nobody else wants to say anything, um, then I guess we can bring this to a close and everybody can, can get some rest. We can binge on some Netflix. <laughs> I'm going to go eat some ice cream and watch Canada's Drag Race. <laughs> I, you must be exhausted. You must be exhausted. I am, but it was you worth must it. Be. <laughs> Thank you so much once yeah. again. All right. And th yeah, thank you guys so much for putting this together. It was absolutely incredible. I'm so glad we got to participate. Uh, it's our pleasure. And, and thank you so much for participating. You know, we couldn't have done it with, if, you know, if people turned around and said, we don't, we're not interested in talking or participating, then there wouldn't have been an event. So thank you. <laughs>